Looks like it's on live. We're, we're live on the air, folks. Hey, everybody. I'm Ramon Mejia from the Little, Little RPG Podcast. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Uh, today, I actually have a wonderful, amazing guest. Uh, his name is Charles Dean. He's author of some amazing Little RPG series, including The Bathroom of Night, The Merchant of Tikba, and War Eternus. Now, Charles and I, have, uh, full disclosure, have been friends for a while. Oh, uh, War Eternus, sir. Okay, I say I say it differently. I, I guess it's the way I read it. I can also can't spell that that word without looking it up, unfortunately. Uh, but Charles and I have been friends for a while. Uh, we first started talking when I made an error with the name of one of his series in the review I gave it uh, on the Literary Podcast website. I called it the Bath Ro uh, the Bathroom Night, <laughs> and he was kind enough to email me uh, and point out my mistake. And ever since then, we talked about we started story building right there. Talking about a plumber who fought evil would be great, but that his his novel was actually called The Bath Robe Night. Uh, we've been friends ever since. And Charles is hands down not only one of the saltiest guys I know, but he's also one of the kindest human beings I've ever had the privilege of knowing. He's gone out of his way to help me personally uh, become a better writer by beta reading my stuff and being uh, brutally honest, uh, and even extending some writing resources to me. And as a writer, I know he's one of the best in the community, uh, and people really love his little bitty stuff. He, everything he's published has an average review score of no less than four stars and often closer to five stars. Um, and some of the comments from readers are like, oh, as I sat there writing this review, my own bathrobe, I must smile. This is a good read. Uh, that was a comment left uh, as a review on by Jesse. Mike Garrett said his biggest disappointment was the lack of an available sequel. Uh, and uh, D. Miller said, all oh, hail the Augustus, god of alcohol and bacon. So people have really loved his stuff. And so thank you, Charles Dean, for coming on the podcast, man. Oh, man, I'm, I'm just actually happy to be here because I've heard you do interviews forever. And I'm like, wait a minute. I've invited you multiple times. When am I getting reciprocity? Right. Sorry. I mean, it's always, yeah, it's always been like, like, oh, what are you, what are you putting out there? Because if, if we just do an interview just because, it seems like a waste because I always like to promote something that an author is doing because it just makes double sense. I mean, I was up talking to people, but it's like, oh, let's do this with purpose uh, so that everybody really benefits. And we also actually should recommend that we're doing this live on YouTube. Uh, so we have a bunch of comments in chat room already. We have a bunch of people there, Emmy Carlson, Alex Strife, Whale, St. Whale, um, Nightmares, um, JS, and a bunch of other people already just dropping in saying hello um and a bunch of other comments will be so we'll be talking we'll be saying their comments as well during the entire interview folks so uh charles thanks for hanging out with me this this today um thanks for being on the podcast. because i know today you're looking to promote uh the release of war Turners for harbinger of ash uh let's just start off real quick with a brief synopsis about what that's about and you know give you a chance to like sell it to me man so i mean i really don't think we can do better than the, like, I loved the blurb, but I, I worked really hard on the blurb, so I don't think I can beat it. And it's just, War Eternus 4 is, we've taken the main character, and he's just had three really tough encounters with different, like, different heralds. And he's, like, he's had four encounters with different heralds, but three of them he had to kind of murder off, like, the murder hobo he is. Um, and it's kind of taken a toll on him, and so when he comes into the fourth book, there is a herald that is kind of like trying to mess with his mind and he's just like working his way through trying to deal with a lot of the choices that end up being in front of him where there is the right path and then there's the wrong path and neither option is casualty free and neither option is easy and he takes one path which i think a few of my readers didn't like the path he took and i, I respect that but uh, they, they called it a villain, but in my head, we would sit down there and I'm trying to kind of, um, and I'm, I know this is gonna be a little bit spoilery, but I, I wanted each character in War Turnus to be uh, emulative of a specific philosopher that has meant something to me. So for Lee himself, he is a mix of like the, um, the nature of man and Kant's utilitarianism. And that's kind of where he ends up just kind of like his PTSD plus those two philosophies have just kind of driven him into some really fun choices and also explosions. 
fire. Yeah, I know. Like I always tell people, like your your books are a lot more layered and complicated than people would give them credit for. Like, because I know you're a super smart guy, and I know you you've read and, and done a lot of thinking and philosophizing. Um, so much so that your your books are really intelligent if you if you take the time to like unpack the layers. And I'm like, what you're saying right now makes total sense to me, even though I wasn't aware of a person. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I can kind of see those, those those kind of things in there. Um, and, and like I said, your, your your novels are among like really the smartest. It's just that most people aren't aren't always going to get them. And the people that do are really going to enjoy like a lot of those like little small interesting notes. Well, one of my favorite characters in the story that I, I'm really having trouble with is I don't know if you if you remember American the rise of American pragmatism is a philosophy. Sure. Okay. It, it's the idea like so American pragmatism is kind of interesting because you would, it's got the word pragmatism. So you're always thinking, oh, it's logical and we do what's best and we do what's in good interest and stuff like that. But if we look at like a lot of the way the books like play out in terms of uh, the anal the analysis of how American thought patterns worked uh, in the early 1900s going in through the late for the American pragmatism. It's both really cold-hearted logic of we do what works no matter whether it's right or wrong, but it's also mixed in with the idea that we have this huge emotional deficit that needs to be paid for each action. And so when I'm like when I'm doing Ling specifically, she is an American pragmatist. She has the cold hearted, they have to do what works. It doesn't matter if it's a wrong action, but then she also has the idea that each action has to be weighed against an emotional deficit. That's just going to creep up and keep compiling itself. And so um, that's one of the main themes that really kind of manifests itself throughout War Turn is four. And I'm hoping that some of my readers will pick up on that is they watch the arguments between Plonk, Ling, Lee, and sometimes even Bridget and Jade kind of interfering because Jade and Dave have no philosophy centers. They're just fucking funny. Um, yeah. yeah, but Ling and Lee both have these conflicting ideas of like utilitarianism and or cons utilitarianism and the state of nature and or John Locke. So John Locke and Kant mixed together for this like really pragmatic point of view and then conflicting with what should have been the final form of it in the American pragmatism with Ling. And so you have these two characters that are like, we got to do the right thing and this is the right thing, but they both don't want to do it for different reasons. And one of them is just kind of constantly batting at the other one. And that's, it was one of my favorite parts of the book. Perfect. I know a lot of, uh, there've been some criticism in the reviews of like, oh, the main character taking this darker path. And for me, that was like super enjoyable to see the um, realistic portrayal of a man who's in power but he's having to realize that being in power sometimes means making hard decisions or, or the most expedient decisions. Like like choosing the the good guy path will get a lot more people killed in these situations than just, you know, doing something that's maybe morally uh, gray, uh, but has like the best cost to benefit ratio. Um, we have a couple of comments in the chat. We're ready about Arthur saying you're gonna try poor lean crazy in, yeah. in your story. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Uh, I love Ling. Uh, she's one of my favorite characters, but I, I'm going to say Jade is, she's grown on me in, in ways because of her just not giving a damn about reality. Yeah, no, and Jade is definitely a popular character. I have to admit that. Um, now Jade is, now describe Jade a little bit for people who haven't read your stories yet. She mm. appears in what book three, I think. Mm -hmm. She appears after the fire or she appears after what I would like to call the uh, fried chicken flight in book six or book three around the end of chapter six coming into chapter seven. And she is essentially what would happen if you took, I want to say Deadpool and you mix Deadpool with a, a weeb, like a full weeb. And then you threw in a crazy cosplayer and added in a, a love struck heroine. And you threw all of those into a pot. And then you just said, let's see what happens. Um, or you could just say it's what happens if you mix Deadpool with Stephanie from The Bathroom of Night, um, and then you just went full anime instead okay. of video game. That would uh, that would be Jade. I'll see there. I think those are nice character reference. Uh, now, before we get into any more of your your series, let's hear a bit a little about yourself because that's what people are showing up for. They're showing up in droves in the chat room, um, asking questions about your beard. They thought it got cut and you lost your power of Samson, but they're also <laughs> hypothesizing that it's regrown due to the power of bacon, which is a theme in, in the War Attorney series. So let's hear a little bit about yourself, how you came to be a writer, uh, why you chose to be a little RPG, that kind of good stuff, man. 
Um, so one of the things I was talking about, I was talking to Hunter about this yesterday because Hunter is an amazing guy and I want to just shout out to James. He's a, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, but the way I started with RPG is I used to translate with students. So I was a Korean English teacher and I would translate a legendary moonlight sculptor with students. They would do the first translation and then I would do a second translation using machine translation, my knowledge of Korean and my knowledge of basic grammar and then see how well the, the two mixed up and where my students went wrong. And I think I went through like 30 to 40 volumes of uh, legendary moonlight sculptor just helping them translate that, helping them get this uh, through and helping them learn English through novels because I hated the idea that a student would only learn English by repeating and memorizing catchphrases. So I was like, no, you need to pick a book you love and I will help you I will help you translate it. I'll help you make sure it works out. We're, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that you enjoy learning English. And it took a lot of effort and I learned a lot of Korean doing it. But um, at a certain point I realized, I hated a lot of things about Legendary Moonlight Sculptor that I thought I could do better. Uh, for instance, inconsistent stats, stats that felt like they didn't mean anything, um, damage formulas that just didn't make sense to me. Um, a lot of the, the, the sense of like, oh, a death isn't a big deal, but it is a big deal. And they would build up this fake sense of like, oh man, he's gonna die and it's gonna be the worst thing ever. And you'd be like, why? He's gonna die and he'll come back in like 12 hours and it's no big deal. So after reading all of that, I decided I was going to give it a try on my own. And um, I was trying to keep my focus. I didn't actually get started till, um, wait, do you still speak Korean for any reason in your everyday life? I like to comment from the chat right now. Um, yes and no. I know like basic phrases still, but you lose language really quickly. So like, while I can still say stuff like, you know, how are you doing? Like, or like when I pick up the phone, I'll sometimes say like, and like some Korean words, I don't use it half as much. And so I've lost like so much vocabulary and I really need to do a vocab prep to get back into it. Um, and one other question I'm gonna answer really quick because this keeps popping up. This is half of the length of my beard used to be. And if you right. don't believe me, ask anyone who met me at Dragon Con and they will tell you it was much longer than this. Yeah, so see, at one point I think he tripped on his own beard while he was walking down the street. My beard used to hit my belly button. Yeah. That was the point where my wife was like, you need to cut your beard. She's like, look Gandalf, we need to trim this thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, that's how I, so I'm sitting here and I really wanted to try writing a book and I kept wanting to try writing a book and I had been moved, I think like four or five times because my wife was in the military and we were on our way home to go see my parents for the first time in like four years and we were doing this drive and it was like pouring down rain so I'm trying to focus and my wife was like, well, if you wanna focus, why don't you just try working on something? And I was like, okay, why don't I try writing a book? And that's actually how I started the bathroom night. So I wrote the bathroom night by dictation to my wife in the car. It's 70 miles an hour down I-75. And uh, it was not great. It was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> and so I called up my buddy and we we had fun fixing it up and posting it on a blog, uh, the bathroom night that blogspot.com. And that sounds good. It does still exist because it has a lot of my copyrights and I don't want to lose them. Like if yeah. Amazon ever takes down my work, I don't want to be left without proof that I had published it when I said I published it. Right. So when, you, when did you first publish that? I can't remember, but I think you were one of the first 20, people to publish. Uh, January 2015 was my first publication date. Right. Um, and then it came out uh, June 2015 in terms of when the book was released. Um, so it basically 2015 because I, I started writing it on the Christmas break of 2014 and we technically I did a I did a hard po or drop post on 2014 and then I went back and then started rewriting it in 2015 and then um, we delayed it two months because I couldn't find a cover artist at which point I found this one cover artist who I can find you guys if you need him Marlon he's a wonderful dude he charges 150 bucks a cover um, and he the covers for all my bathroom night series and that was, uh, that was we finally got it out in 2015. And technically the first cover I did not get, we could not find one. And my little brother purchased the cover and found my artist. And that was awesome. Oh, oh look at that family helping you out. Yeah, my little brother has been supporting me forever. He shows up in, um, in the bathroom night is Alex of Stormguard or Alex of the Stormguard Alliance. Like he is the, uh, the NPC scout who kind of ranks up throughout the book. And then he shows up in, um, in War Turnus as Lee. 
I named uh, my character after him and my godfather. Oh, see, perfect. See, family just popping in everywhere. Now, you've mentioned uh, you have a couple of the Little PG series, including um, besides War Returners, which is the one that, that is the most recently published. Um, you also have The Bathroom of Night and you have Merchant of Tikba. Can you give me a quick summary of both of those and see how they're different than this one? Uh, the Bathroom of Night was my first attempt, so I'm going to say it's worse. I know a lot of people like it, but for me, it was just my first attempt at writing. I tried multiple perspectives. I didn't do it well. Um, I tried doing a few other things, and I just, you know... Every time I tried to do something on the bathroom night, I would find where I made mistakes. And then when I wrote War Eternus, I found more mistakes. Um, specifically, the first chapter was just terrible in War Eternus. Like the first three chapters were just like, it was really rough. And I think I've definitely gotten uh, the hang of it. But War or Bathroom Night was basically my rough draft. It had a lot more uh, what people like to call campy. I like to call it just Monty Python style humor. It's got like immature stuff going on. Um, it's just me and my buddy were having a bunch of beers and drinking, or we were drinking beers and eating fried chicken and just typing out for fun. Right. And that one's more of a trapped in the game, little RPG story, like a little more yeah. traditional, like he's trapped in the video game and he gets this unique race and he goes on these adventures and he builds a community and a kingdom and he has these big epic fights sometimes. And yes. that's a, yeah. And then the Merchant of Tikpa is three separate stories. Uh, the third Merchant of Tikpa hasn't been published and I don't think it will get published. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold it back because it Merchant Tikpa one and two did not sell well, and I don't want to put a lot of effort into the cleanup and paying the editors because I feel like the editors will cost me more than the book will net me. And I'm just gonna be honest there, like if you if you have to pay more for editors, then the book is gonna make you profit. You just kind of hold it back, and you're like, that's not worth it. Mm -hmm. um, but the third Merchant of Tikpa was, or the first three Merchant of Tikpa, or the three books of Merchant of Tikpa were based on three of my favorite Shakespeare plays. And they're based on the first one being The Merchant of Venice. And then the second and the third one, well, the second one's coming out on Audible. So let's see how many people figure out which which Shakespeare book it's based on. You'll love it when you figure yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah. Now we have a question from Donna saying, um, did you ever did you go the Royal Royal route? Uh, no, I published always on Blogspot, and I had a lot of help from the wonderful people over at Gravity Tales and Booksia World and uh, Jaws Translation. I forget what it was. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so I had, I had help from several friends who already had established websites, and they helped me get going. And I didn't need to do the Royal Road route, so I just I did goof off on Royal Road uh, Chitango all the time. So that did happen. Yeah, and it looks like I'm getting a little bit of reverb um, from maybe your your speakers a little bit. Maybe. Um, so just that, um, like I, I can adjust that. Like I have I have controls here. I can adjust volume stuff um, a little bit there. We'll see how they, if that works out better. Um, but let's go back to War of a little bit. Uh, so that's the novel that you're talking about currently right now. That's the one that just came out not that long ago. Um, it's a wonderful story, in, in my opinion. Um, tell me a little bit about some of your characters. Sure. There's oh, also you mean, the eighth rune. That's right. I always forget that one. Um, it's, a, it's a free to read book that has not been edited, but I did like the first part of War or the eighth rune. I can throw up there. It, it technically has been edited. I just haven't finished publishing the edited version. I'll call up my editor tonight and get him to do it. Um, but it's free to read on dnovels.com. There you go. Perfect. Uh, so that's that's there as well. So um, you talked a little bit about some of your main characters, War Eternus. Um, you talked about Lee. You talked about Jade. You talked about Ling. I haven't heard a lot about Miller, though. I know Miller's a favorite character in that story. Is, is there a philosopher that he's based on? Mm. Um, Miller would not be based on a specific philosopher, per se. He is definitely based on what I like to call um, my years and years of playing video games online. And there's that paladin character that's just obsessed with stuff. Like, uh, Miller is the embodiment of violence escapism, and I love it. Like, the idea that life hasn't dealt you a good hand, and so you accept a role that you're not necessarily wanting to take, but feels comfortable because doing that role creates a cathartic release to deal with emotional stress. And as you read in book two, you start to understand what his emotional stress was, and why it manifests in the way it does. And he's just a really fun character once you figure him out and once you understand him. But another problem with him is that type of person is so simplistic that it's really hard to build character arcs around him. So he ends up taking sort of a back burner by the time book three and book four appear. And he's no longer a predominant feature, but I just, I still like him a lot. You know, a lot of people love him a lot. I think just in the comments in the live chat, they're like, Miller. 
Uh, and that's mostly because um, our friend Jeff Hayes does the audiobook narration. Where I think he does an Arnold Schwarzenegger voice for for that particular character, and so he has a very distinctive voice for people who listen to the audiobook version of of that novel. Um, and there are plenty of people saying Miller is my spirit animal, uh, and they love Miller. Uh, Keegan Hall asks, uh, "What about Dave? Where did you get Dave from?" Dave. I got Dave from Dave. Oh, there you go. If you've ever met uh, Dave Wilmarth in real life, he is a cantankerous, uh, lecherous old man and one of my favorite people to talk to, which I need to stop saying that. Um, not not that Dave is one of my favorite people, but I, I for some reason, every time I mention somebody, I'm like, that person's my favorite person. <laughs> I'm like, wait, that's losing its value. Uh, but Dave Wilmarth is one of the most hilarious, accidentally hilarious people because he says lines that I don't think he realizes are as funny as they are until after he said them. And then you're just laughing on the side. You're like, yes, yes, that was priceless. And um, I tried to capture him and then twist him to be a, even more lascivious than he was in the uh, in the book, or I mean, in real life. And I think I nailed it. I don't know if I nailed it, but I think I nailed it. I think most people love, like really enjoy Dave and his personality, especially as he's become a more prominent character um, in like books three and four. Um, like he's really somebody like, oh, that's he has some very interesting lecherous viewpoints. And like, oh, that's uh, that's really fun. Um, but talking about what you're trying to send, I want to give like a quick synopsis of it for people who are interested in getting to it. Um, I would call it a transported to a RPG world where the main character, Lee, is is grabbed against as well to kind of uh, participate in this God game where um, the main character becomes a herald, he becomes an agent of, of a certain God of crafting and beer. And he's supposed to com com uh, compete against other other agents like him. And he, he'll either win or he'll lose. And that's kind of the big story arc of him competing and fighting against other other characters, but also like this nice fantasy community building world eventually. Um, and there's lots of good action and adventure and stuff so for, for people can kind of, you know, get their teeth in and get, if you're, if you're a deeper reader than I am, uh, you get some of the the philosoph uh, philosophy in there and you get some very interesting character development um, in it as well. So great stuff all around. Do keep in mind though that Lee is going to be hypocritical throughout the book to small degrees because he's still human. Yeah. And I hate, I hate reading books where the character is constant all the way through because people aren't constant. So why would any character in a book be constant? Yeah, no, and, and Lee is definitely one of the, I, in my opinion, one of the characters that I've been super fascinated with his character or some book one. Um, and again, this is my other spoiler folks, if you haven't read the series, but we're not going to get too, too deep, but in, in book one, he's kind of a limp. He, he's very much a man of the modern world where violence isn't your first solution necessarily. And we're not all used to murdering people. That's for sure. Um, and so he's, he's literally dropped the first thing he does. He's dropped in this, um, in this fight with a zombie and he doesn't want to get hurt. And he doesn't understand like uh, the consequences of combat and what it really means to fight to the death. Um, and that's where he starts out he's, he's kind of a wimpy character in a lot of like ways. And as you get to book two and book three, and now in book four, you see like his, his growth, not just in, in combat and magic and crafting, but you also see his growth morally, like him adapting to this medieval world where, where murder is constant, nobody's life is fell safe, that there are really bad people who abuse their powers on a regular basis in, in this in this huge conflict between demigods essentially and gods. Um and 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 it's just like this fascinating arc where he just becomes more and more and more, more at this point morally ambivalent, willing to do like uh, what he would he would and book one would have considered terrible, horrible things that he would never would have imagined himself doing because it, they, they, in practical terms, mean saving the people he loves, his communities, his his team members. Um, and I think that's a very interesting journey that you've taken that character on. Yeah, yeah, let's go with that. That sounds awesome, bro. I like what you did there. I mean, I was just going to continue talking about the, the libidinous ribald um, that is... Dave, but yeah, we can talk about Lee. Um, <laughs> wait, wait. Well, hold on. The main I, I have to distract for a second. Why right. are all the good words to describe a lusty old man starting with L? Like you've got lascivious, you've got libidinous, you've got licentious, you've got lecherous. Like you've got so many great words to, to describe a horny old bastard that all start with L. And I'm just like, they just pick L A and L I, and then they're like, these are all, oh yeah, in Lars, that's another oh, word. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I was going to go with lewd and, you know, lecherous and licentious and all that. But let's go with Lars. That's the perfect word to describe a horny old bastard. Um, 
how come they're all starting with L? Like that's a weird thing. Am I am I the only one who thinks that's weird? No, no, I, I'm pretty oh. sure you're correct. I I, I, I I forgot a word, lush, yeah. because typically I think of a lush as somebody who's a drunk, mm. and I don't like to use words that have negative implications about drunks. Um, it just seems seems counterintuitive for my for my branding. Right, and definitely people in the chat room are chatting with other other parts of here, um, and they agree with you. Lots lots of alliteration in the, in the L. Um, description words game reads is saying they've missed ramon's kitchen yeah uh, I, I, I i didn't think it was appropriate to have a green screen on the live podcast so we get the kitchen back for a day folks uh that also blends in with all the other author interviews uh leering keegan halls is adding to it you think he's suggesting maybe it's the latin roots for for that particular word that may be influencing everybody's uh thesaurus word choices um i like how Keegan threw out the caca because that's a throwback to if you were part of the the caca point for the uh, War Eternus for original reading, where oh. Jeff tried to say the word caca, which he's supposed to be like caca, and it's supposed to be ridiculous, and Jeff was just like caca, and he could not get it right, and everybody was just making fun of him for like thirty five minutes about it, and I loved it. Um, but yeah, now Keegan Keegan always points out like the the the, the logical explanation and ruins my fun. So we're just gonna move on. Uh, thanks a lot, Keegan. We were having such a great time too. <sighs> I'm gonna rename him Wet Towel Hall instead of Keegan Hall. <laughs> You're just forcing the name change on his YouTube profile, Wet Towel, City Keegan yeah, Hall. Wet Towel. How dare you bring logic and intelligence to our conversations? <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on to a few more questions from the interview portion of this. Um, your genre that you're writing currently is lit RPG. You, you mentioned like what got you into writing in the genre. Um, what drew you into like reading and being a part of that community? Mm. So I read a ton of crap. I mean like a ton of crap uh, and not always like crap that most of my readers would read. Like uh, just as I was mentioning earlier in Game Lit Society, um, I just finished reading Bringing Home the Nation's Husband. It, it, it's a terrible rom-com about a girl who gets married to a guy she's been in love with and he loves her, but neither one of them will admit it. And then there's this like back and forth where the misunderstandings continuously escalate at each party's harm. Um, and the family is all terrible and stuff. And this is the type of books that I'll read sometimes. I read cultivation stuff. I read lit RPG stuff. And out of all of them, I constantly found myself drawn to lit RPG because it made more sense to me than fantasy. Like, I can't tell you the number of cultivation novels like I shall seal the heavens. Ah! I'm, I'm, I'm trying to add some dramatic flair because everything in that book has randomly overexcited, over dramatic flair to the point where, and I'm not even kidding you. If you insult somebody, they will literally start coughing up blood and falling to the ground and having trouble dealing with themselves. They're like, oh, I've been insulted. Oh, my blood is coming out of my mouth with every cough and my world will end. And how dare he kill me by just insulting me? Um, so I was reading a bunch of fantasy and cultivation and all this stuff. And I realized the lit RPG that was done right. I mean, like the really well done lit RPG made a lot more sense to me than anything else because I didn't have to go, oh, well that guy attacked that guy and his emotions were higher, so he wins. I, I got to go like, oh, that guy attacked that guy and he used this cool trick, so he wins. Or he used this like neat maneuver or he took advantage of his stats. And there was always some logical reason why he won other than, oh, he, you know, he had higher emotions than the other guy. Like I can't stand the Dragon Ball Z stories. I love Dragon Ball Z, but yeah, I, I get what you mean. And that emotion plays a lot of like power references. I'm like, okay, I get it. But yeah. Dragon Ball Z is not something you should ever love. Like I will tell you what, I can summarize entire Dragon Ball Z in like five minutes and save you 500 hours of nonsense. Um, Goku's feelings will get hurt. Somebody will try to take over the world. Goku's feelings will get hurt again. He'll spend like 25 episodes charging up. Somebody will die. Stakes will get raised. And then the emotions will reach their climax, in which case Goku turns colors, goes, Aah! and then explodes onto his victim, and then the game is over and it restarts. Wow, that, that sounds like the porn parody version of that as well. I'm just saying. There's no difference. Yeah. Okay, so that's a great... Oh, oh, the uh, porn version is a lot less hairier because yes, in, in the Dragon Ball Z regular version, they grow hair with every power-up. and the porn version, they lose hair with every power-up. They're like, we uh, went from 45-year-old 
hairy Indian guy to like, I don't know. Can I can I be as racist as Dragon Ball Z is, assuming that if you're blonde with blue eyes, you have more powers? I had always thought that was a little weird, to be honest. I'm like, oh, that, that that's an interesting influence there. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, no, you shouldn't watch Dragon Ball Z. It's a waste of your time. It's like the fetch quest on Fallout 76. Like, you're just going to be running back and forth doing nothing with your life. I think it's a great, uh, great series. I think uh, you should probably skip a lot of these uh, Frieza saga. But, you know, it, it's very funny. I actually like the uh, original Dragon Ball a little bit better. It's a little more fun and campy with little Goku uh, running Ball's around fun. everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, Arthur says someone needs a meme for Charles powering up. You have enough hair. I think that would work. We just you just suddenly die. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I I will work on finding somebody who will dye my hair back to to blonde. <sighs> back to blonde. Oh, perfect. I was okay. blonde uh, until I was four years old. Were you? That seems weird. Yeah, I mean, there's so, tons of children pictures of me where I was blonde. Mm, I'll have to wait until we see these to believe that. I, th I think that's a show me it's, uh, kind of statement there. It's not uncommon for kids to who have my level of brown hair to start off blonde, and then it just gets darker as you get older. I come from a dark-haired culture. It never goes light at all, so I I, I don't know. And you're 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 a you're a Hispanic person living in California, right? Yeah, that's no true. hablo español or no hablas español. Uh, un poquito, mi amigo. So you don't really speak any Spanish, even though you come from a Spanish family and you live in a state full of Spanish speakers. No, no, my parents were very they had a very interesting child raising philosophy, which is common at the time. That if you only taught your child one language, he would be much more proficient in that language than if you divided his attention between two. And this is very much of a an immigrant kind of um, mentality in wanting your kids to enculturate um, as quickly as possible so they don't face the same prejudices and um, and pitfalls that they did um, having to learn English um, growing up. Uh, and so that's, that's why I only, only mostly only speak Spanish. I took Spanish in high school, but that's kind of the extent of my my extracurricular languages. I, I speak in a little French and other languages when I go traveling outside of the country, but that's kind of it. Uh, my grandfather's all the same way of me in Swedish, so you're on the same boat. Um, chat room apparently is very interested that they think I should have frosted tips mm -hmm. um, and that I will be a silver fox someday. That's not going to happen. As you can tell, his hair stays permanently black. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit of like uh, gray in the sides currently. I don't know how 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 silvery it's going to be. My my parents, uh, my, my both of them, into their fifties, and they're like, oh, they're they're still relatively dark hair. I I have uh, just a plethora of random gray and silver hairs all the way through my face, and I like to blame that on the stress of uh, being married. Mm, yeah, <sighs> yeah. There you go. Married, married gray hair. Uh, let's see. Back to lit RPG a little bit more. Okay. Uh, so a few writing questions for you. I know we've you and I have talked about writing plenty of times, and we do like some um, beta reading for each other occasionally. So we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, when it comes to lit RPG and your writing stuff, how much research do you do as an author? Uh, a ton, as I'm sure you're aware. I I will sit down with um, whatever I'm reading, whatever I want to write. I will generally like probably plan out and try to get a full understanding of it. So the crafting system coming up for the new book is pretty intense. I'm going to be posting the first chapter of it on the website tonight or Monday, one of the two. And it, uh, it involved me having to literally learn how to build like tiny calculators on like our Arduino calculators with little eight bit uh, boards and the little wires and stuff and figure out how transistors work and all that just so I could write like, <laughs> one book and watch my wife come in here for a sneak attack. Are you coming for the wine? No. Okay. <laughs> I needed to make sure. Oh, you're so cute. Hey. Hi, how's it going? Good, this how are you? Why I have gray hair is because I'm always stressed out about making her happy. Uh, that just should be a great thing to be stressed out about or worry in your life. Oh, she's Thank the you. best. Yes. Yes, she is. I've met her. I agree. No. Oh. Okay. Fun. Uh, I, I was talking about how research I do for books and stuff. And she has to deal with all of the aftermath because when I'm researching something, I get really excited about it and talk to her about it for hours on end. And she tunes it out. She's like, blah, 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 computer stuff. Writing She's like, I, di I didn't marry a hardware hardware designer. Like, like, I'm trying to play a game. Yeah. I love you, dear. Oh, I love that lot. Look, look at that, folks. A great insight into the married life of Charles Dean that you probably were never going to get to see otherwise. Um, so 
when you were doing your um, in-depth research on 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 transistors, but at the same time you're you're building that new computer. Hmm. Actually, my new computer is what inspired me. Ah, see, there you go. I always uh, like that. I, I I built and designed this beautiful new computer, which. I would show you guys, but the jealousy would be too much. Mm, it lights up. It has like a liquid cooling. I think it also goes zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds. It, it does have liquid cooling. I went with the all-in-one uh, thermal. What is it? Thermal. I forget what they call it. It's hold on. They have like some fancy brand. It's not the Corsair. Thermal. Uh, Liquid cooling. I gotta type this up. Thermal take. That's it. Thermal take. Uh -huh. Man, I was gonna like. I was stumbling on it. So I got the uh, the three fan uh, extended radiator, all in one um, RGB lighted thermal thermal take uh, liquid yep. cool. There's so Keegan. He's like nice. thermal take. He he named it for you. Uh, Emmy Carlson wants to also ask: Did you take your old computer out back and smash it with the baseball bat before lighting it on fire, or if so, did you make s'mores afterwards? So I haven't watched Office Space recently, but I wanted to do that. And my wife reminded me that my old computer is still worth a lot of money and I should probably just get it fixed properly. So I'm going to take it by a specialist eventually. And um, uh, I'm going to have to get it fixed. And then I'm, I was going to send it to one of my buddies who is a uh, avid reader of everything in lit RPG, but uh, he already got another computer. So I don't have to worry about that. I was really, I was stressing because um, he's been a fan for a fan of mine for a very long time, and I was worried that a situation had depleted to where he couldn't even play a video game. I was like, "Man, that is terrible. I got to hook yeah. you up." I've heard that too. I'm like, oh, your computer just like slowly like loses its game playing ability. You're like, "Oh no, I need a new one." Yep, that's the curse of like being part of the PC master race. Yeah, so I'm actually gonna have to take it by a specialist, and then I think I'm gonna give it to either a family member or a friend or something, um, just because I'm not gonna use it. So. Why not find someone who will? It's worth a lot. So why why waste the money on toast or why why toast it when somebody else could use it? So yeah, right. I say just take the old case and put a, put a bunch of like explosive things and film it. It'll be nice promotional work for the explosiveness of your Lex book. <sighs> that yeah. stuff bothers me so much. Uh, I love blowing stuff up, but I I'm not an environmental nut, but I hate wasting materials. I mm -hmm. I, I have a very it's it's cringy when I see something like that's worth thousands of dollars being destroyed where it could be either given away or something. And I'm just like, I get that you're doing it for views or whatever on YouTube. But to me, I'm just like, you realize that that is worth more than some people's paychecks for like a month and you're just toasting it in like a minute. And I just want to stab you for that because it's so wasteful. It's like other people could use that. Be generous. Don't don't be that guy. <laughs> I think the chat room is crazy. Like there, he actually cringed when he said that. Yeah, it's cringe worthy. Um, I want to ask you a few questions before I get them from the chat room. Someone asked earlier, um, do you plan on translating your work into anything other than English at some point? Uh, yeah, we talked about this just today. Uh, Ramon and I did. Um, and I plan on getting my, I, I want my works translated and I've talked to some people about French and Russian and uh, the next language I really want to tackle is not Japanese because Japanese people hate Americans. So why would they read like anything in American uh, or from America, but uh, either Korean or Chinese, because even if like only 5% of like a standard market in China picks it up, that's still a huge amount of people and I love Chinese work. So why not try to share mine with them? Of course they hate Americans. So that might also not work well. Yeah. And remember, folks, the uh, the views of Charles Dean do not necessarily represent the entire Little Pity podcast. Just a disclaimer. I mean, I'm not lying. Like, have you ever read anything from China? They're like, those damn, like, I read Chinese novels all the time, and I have to, like, stop myself every five minutes when they're like, those dirty white people. And I'm just like, it's just a novel, Charles. Move on. Uh, again, I haven't read the novels you read. I can't speak to that in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to assume that everybody in the world loves everybody. Uh, I think that's a wonderful view to to write. That's from. a terrible view. That's just ignorant. Who the hell thinks everybody loves everybody? If everybody loved everybody, we wouldn't have the issues we have today. Like I, I, we have societies literally built on the destruction of other societies. Okay, and I live in a My Little Pony world. I'm hanging out with my nieces too much, watching too many uh, pony. Pony High School commercial television shows, I guess. 
There you go. Care Bears. That's yeah, right. That's, that's what Chet Sember says. He's Ramon is such a Care Bear. Oh, I'm I like, just saw that. Chet, Chet, good job. Well done. Fucking Care Bears. The power of love. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. There no, you go. actually, you know, War Turnus does tackle this issue a lot. It's that uh, if you look at human nature, it's it's pretty freaking despicable. It is cruel. It is, it's awful. And I'm not saying that like all of people are awful. If you take a hundred people in any population, I think like 80 of them will be great. But how well those five to ten that are super awful can convince the other 80 to like behave. It's uh, it's kind of like it's 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 pretty bad. Like they have the uh, what was the passport scam all the way through the Middle East, where people were holding passports of their um, their certain like they would hire people from the Philippines and they would hire people from India, and then when they got over there, they would just take the passports and then force them into indentured servitude and slavery almost just because they couldn't do anything. They were stuck in that country. They were stuck without the ability to get another job because without your passports, you couldn't apply for another job. You couldn't go home. You were just essentially an indentured servant or a slave. And this was like considered common practice for like 50% of the wealthy people in these countries. And then that's not even going into like the 1.3 or 1.4 million sex slaves that we've actually accounted for in the world. Like it's, it's not a pretty world. Not everybody loves everybody. And the liturgy podcast took such a serious turn. Uh, it's usually not the case, folks, uh, but it's okay. We're, we're free to talk about anything you like here. Um, lots of folks in the chat room are definitely uh, commenting on the, how horrible human nature is. Um, uh, things happening in America. Uh, Charles is being compared to Threadbare. If I'm, if I'm a Care Bear, apparently Charles is, is the Threadbare Bear, um, who's the golem in, in another lit RPG novel there. Um, I, so I'm I, the I would like to be an RPK or little Ethan. Like I don't want to be, I don't want to infringe on Andrew Seeple's territory because Andrew Seeple is an amazing guy. I He's like a very him. nice guy. I met him once. I actually, I have a, I have, a, I have a double date with Andrew Seeple, and I'm really excited about it. Oh, week. good for you. Yeah, and no, I met him at a at a, at a writing conference in Las Vegas. Really, really nice guy. Um, so moving back onto writing a little bit, uh, we'll talk about a few bit of your writing habits, personal things. Uh, Full time or part time writer. Actually, I'm a full time, and I'm now currently the breadwinner in the family, which because my wife uh, just left her job. Mm, that is makes it much more scary. I'll be honest. Uh, no, not yeah. scary. The word is terrifying. Yeah. Um, she uh, she said she's going to pick up another job in a few months, and I'm uh... <sighs> there. We go, folks. If you saw his beard move, that was his heart pulsing outside of his chest a little bit uh, uh, in terror. Um, uh, did sell a hundred thousand books this year, uh, including yeah. audiobooks. So, uh, 2018, I have sold. I reached the hundred thousand mark um, early November, which very was good. Nice. Congratulations, man! I think uh, someone in chat to us asked if you plan to branch out from lit RPG. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think you um, already have branched out from lit RPG a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to keep writing books outside of lit RPG that I'm going to keep posting online for free. And if you ever just want to read them, uh, feel free to. Uh, the Eighth Rune was the last one I wrote, and I plan on writing another. I, I plan on writing a rom com that is almost finished, and I'm going to post it soon. And it's called a uh, Big Trouble, or it's called Little Trouble with Big Sister, um, off of the mockery of Big Trouble Little China. And it is essentially every single trope and cliche you can possibly think of shoved into a single freaking story and uh i loved it it is it is horrible it's got the time traveling tropes it's got the the japanese anime tropes it's got the american high school tropes it's got the i took in the uh some of the german tropes that we don't have in america i had to look them up on trope tv or tvtropes.com and i had to find all the good tropes and i just would go down the list on tv tropes i was like how can we put these into a single book and it's awesome hmm Tropius trope book. Okay, sounds fun. A um, few more questions about writing. What is your, how's your writing day scheduled or structured? Are you a five a weekday kind of guy? You write seven days a week. Do you have set amounts of word counts or hourly times? Uh, I just get really drunk and type. The best way to do it. Great stream of consciousness writing there. You get some of the best. I, I believe me. I've read some of his stuff, uh, and I'm like, oh yeah, that was that was definitely a drunk sentence there. Um, it's barely legible, but it's very interesting. Hmm. So I call up my buddy Ramon. This is how my writing process works is I call up my buddy Ramon and then I call up my buddy um, Richie, who you know, great guy. 
And I argue with them for about five or six hours on the phone. And then it gets me an idea and I'm like, okay, that's a good idea. And then I watch uh, Psych and I watch other TV shows. I put them on in the background. I start playing some StarCraft and I start drinking. And then I wake up with 10,000 words written. Yep. That's, uh, that's how it works. I, I, I think it's called the Cujo method, the Stephen King Cujo method. Oh, and I also drink a shit ton. Oh, pardon my language. A crap ton of, of uh, caffeine while I'm doing this because caffeine and alcohol is how life was made. If you put enough caffeine into enough alcohol and you combine its powers, you summon up the dark force of every creative writer's wet dream. And then you put it on paper and your readers will hate you, but you will feel great and blissful inside. Now, caffeine, I, I, I remember somewhere you saying that you hated coffee. So what kind of caffeine are you intaking? Uh, I do. So here I have a cup of black tea that I have finished. If you can tell, I have this beautiful, look at this, medieval times. I have been trying to find this particular mug. I want this specific mug and I want 20 of them and I can't find these fuckers and there's no medieval times around me. So it's really been pissing me off. Um, I should have I should have looked for one when I was in Atlanta. I love these mugs. It's like it's it's a standard 30 ounce style mug. It's got a beautiful handle. It's got the bottom, so you don't need a coaster. It's microwavable. It's just it's amazing. Um, and then in this one, I have uh, a poured monster. And uh, so black tea and monster are typically the two sources of caffeine I like to combine. No, perfect. The next question was, where do your ideas come from? I think you've answered that question, though, in that, in that last statement, black tea, uh, monster, and alcohol. Right. Um, yeah, that's about it. That's about uh, it. Next one, um, plant, uh, outliner, or a, pl a plotter, or a pantser? Uh, I think you you definitely know I'm a, I'm a planner. Everything goes in like uh, before I've written the before I've started writing a book. I know where the book's going to go, what I want to do with the twists and turns, how the characters are going to develop. That doesn't mean that there won't be like in the middle of a story, I'll just be like, no, this doesn't make sense. This character is going to need to do this. And I'll end up with an entirely new plot uh, halfway through. And that's my, um, that's how my stories get written. Like if a new plot, like if a character is going to do something and it's logically, that's the next step, I will alter the plot. But for the most part, I go in with a very set plot that I try to keep to and often fail. And it's not a smoking jacket. It is a bathrobe because I am not a barbarian. I am a civilized man and civilized people wear bathrobes. Right. There's a question for the chat room for the people who are just listening to the audiobook version of this or the audio version. Like someone asks, is Charles wearing a smoking jacket? No, he's wearing a bathrobe. I like, I like personally like to think he's cosplaying as his character from the bathrobe night. I once beat a man half to death with a bathrobe on. I am the bathrobe night. So there you go. And not the bathroom night. That was an entirely different plot point that I have the copyrights to. Sleeves aren't long enough for a straight jacket. Yeah. Yeah. That's thanks. Thanks, Carlson. I'm not wearing a straight jacket. That, that's right. Uh, okay. A couple more questions. Um, hardest and easiest thing about writing for you? Uh, the hardest thing is when you get interrupted. If you like, if, okay, I don't know if other writers have this, but if I am writing and I am in the zone and even one person breaks me out of it with like, too many Facebook messages where it starts beeping and then I end up looking down to see if it was an emergency and now I'm like, I've lost my train of thought. Or if like my wife walks in or like my family members call, which I, wait, they're not gonna listen to this. Yeah, I totally ignore them half the time, but the, the sound will interrupt me. Um, I, had to, I had to think for a second. I'm like, wait a second, will my mom actually listen to this? No. It's like, hmm, which, which podcast is this again? Yeah. Which, I uh, want, want, want to throw something out there. The reason all of my books have incredibly PG-13 language is because my mother said if I ever wanted to be a writer, I needed to make sure I didn't cuss because cussing was the tool of an incompetent writer. And so all of my books avoid cuss words whenever possible. Um, but when, when I'm writing, if anything interrupts me, that is the hardest moment of writing is to go from out of the zone to back in the zone. It can take an hour, it can take two hours. When you are, when you are writing, you need to be distraction free and even a five second interruption can cost you an hour. Right. I, th I think you still include um, euphemisms uh, and excl ex expletives. They're just fantasy versions. I think we were just talking about an Irish uh, where there was like 27 letters long. It was like slash the Bible or something. Are you talking about the word? Yeah. That How I do you say that again? Oh my God. 
Yeah, yeah. It was something you try to get Jeff to read for for Warrior Turners Four. Marful yeah. Sandlagar. I don't even know how to say it properly. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. I can say it when I'm sober because I had I had a Gaelic coach uh, help me out with the pronunciation, but it is a very long word. I'm going to post in the chat really quick, and it essentially means uh, giant sky hunter. It has a uh, it has a very specific meaning that I I hope people appreciate if they ever figure it out. All of my words have like very specific meanings. And they're not just random words. And I, I love the fact that a lot of people are going to think they are. They're just like, oh, that's a bunch of random letters. I'm like, nah, I got you, son. Do your research. Know. Every time I've read one of your books, I had, there's at least four or five words in that. I have to look up on, on, on dictionary.com or something. What does this mean? I don't know what this word is. So it's like every, every one of your books is like an educational experience into expanding my vocabulary. What was the one that you had trouble with on book four? I know it started with an S. Um, it could be any number of words, man. Um, so there you go. Uh, how long on average does it take you to write a book, man? What, was it sedulous? It was sedulous, wasn't it? You remarked it. You you cop like you highlighted it and you were like, I had no idea what this meant. And I was like, I do people everything. not know what sedulous means. It's a very common word. Um, how long does it take me to write a book? Uh, it used to take me three to four months. Uh, lately, if I actually kick it hard, I can generally write a book in about a month, which is what I'm going to try to do is I want to release 12 books next year. So that'll be fun. Wow. That is, that is super ambitious. I got to uh, applaud you. I'm going to go for it. Close to that. Yeah. Uh, I've been challenged by several people and I'm going to go for it. I get, uh, I get to start this year. And so I have a little bit of a head start, like, you know, a little bit of a day swing. Um, but if I write every day, I write, write, and I actually sit down, I average about two to 5,000 words. So mm -hmm. anywhere between 60 to, um, no man, math, 150,000 words a month is where I'm going to be at. And so it shouldn't be too hard. It's just building up the habit of sitting in front of a computer writing without just researching. Cause I get lost in research so much. I just totally cannot stop myself from just staring at like fun research items like, oh, what is this mythological creature in Ireland? Or, oh, how do you build this computer? And, oh, let me watch this video on how swords work and so forth. Like, I think I, I watched like 19 different sword stance uh, video tutorials all the way to the end last month. And that was not fun, but it was also a blast at the same time. Not fun and being I don't like to feel stupid. But Right. And speaking of things that distract you, uh, do you still read? Um, uh, like for, for pleasure, for entertainment in, in addition to writing. I know a lot of authors when they start writing full time, like I, I haven't read it in months cause I'm just focusing on writing. Oh, that's nonsense, man. Even if I just sit down on the toilet, I can still knock out like four or five chapters a day. Like just, just toilet reading can do that. Like how am I not going to be able to do that? Like I'm never going to give up reading. If I ever give up reading, you can just take me out back and shoot me because my life's not worth living. Uh, anything uh, in particular that you're enjoying right now? Well, like I said, I just finished, uh, the I, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do this this Ramon style. I just finished the takes uh, taking home the nation's husband. I would give it a solid seven point four out of ten because it was incredibly entertaining. The twists and turns were uh, sympathetic to a Spanish soap opera, and if you like romance movies that are terrible, that is uh, that's your that's gonna be some good hit. I'm also reading Trial Marriage, which I put down because I would give it a six or five and a half because it just doesn't have a lot. Like they reach the end of the story and then they just keep going, which I hate. Like one of the worst things I, I, I hate about romance stories is when they keep going after they reach the happily ever after because you know, like you're like, I know this isn't gonna work out well. Like just like stop there with the good part. Um, yeah. In terms of lit RPG, I'm reading some stuff by John Wally. I don't know if you know him. I think I've, I've yeah, seen him a couple uh, times wrote, here and there. He wrote Alpha something. I just picked it up. Uh, I'm gonna. So far, I would actually give this like a six and a half to a seven and a half uh, between those two. I'm not sure. I haven't finished it, so let's let's wait. I'm gonna reserve. But uh, it's well written, and the only thing that I'm having an issue with is. I feel like he knows how to do an action scene and he knows how to push forth a plot. But the problem is he he stumbles on tone, he stumbles on voicing, and he stumbles on some of the descriptions of like, I don't feel like I know the emotions of the characters and that for me is a slight bit of an issue. So that's uh, that would be that book I was, I'm reading right now. And then the other book I am reading is I'm going through Nora for like the fifth time because I don't know if you guys know this, but I got a package in the mail 
And I haven't opened it yet. I had to open it on my Kindle because I'm not going to open it until I'm drinking with him. But I got uh, signed copies of Nora, and I'm really, really pumped up about that. I freaking love uh, Nora. I also love uh, – you guys don't know this because I haven't showcased it a lot, but this is another book I'm reading. And I don't often want to give credit to – other people who are new authors because they're all trying to take my money as dirty bastards. Um, but this guy is really, Eric Rounds is really just a fun guy to talk to online. So when he sent me a book and he put me in and I had to read it. And so I'm on my, I'm reading it and it's just, it's really a fun story. I'll say the descriptions are not where I want them. The language could be neater. The plot, like, I don't want to go into too much until I finish it, but I would give it a seven easily out of 10. Like I said, it's, it's just, it's on point for what I expect out of a little RPG. Yeah, look at that. Reviews with Charles. There should be a whole like side segment on, on, on the podcast on a regular basis. I think we tried it once. Um, wasn't this, wasn't this efficient? Well, my issue with the, uh, with the, this one versus like, I read the Lars one recently is you can tell if you get the hard copies and the way he does the tabling, it's not at all pleasant for me. Um, the language, like the, the book is good. The tabling wasn't pleasant for me. Um, the way the descriptions came out, he he did a lot of like what really ticks me off in with RPG sometimes is like, for instance, you can have so-and-so looking at somebody pityingly. And it's like, how, how do you have pity is a look? Like, you've got to describe that to me because I'm very confused. It's like, man, he looked at him angrily. And I'm like, please show me the anger. Don't just say anger. Like, he flared his eyebrows. He he furrowed his eyebrows. He he his his nose like clenched up and his face went red or like his ears waggled like tiny little dogs. Like give me something funny or entertaining or something descriptive to look at. And yet they just show like they're like, "Ah, this was the emotion that he was feeling." And I'm like, "How could you tell? How do you know that was the emotion?" Like, "Come on, seriously, son. Come on, son. Don't do this shit to me." And um I, I don't know. For me, that's a small annoyance I have with lit RPG is the number of times I have to read so and so had this emotion, and I don't have like any indicators that the person had the emotion. And so when you're doing it from like third person, you can say that the main character had emotions. That's totally fine. You can be like the main character felt sad. The main character did this because that's the perspective you've chosen. But when you say that like a side character did this, like you're doing this from the main character's perspective. So how does the main character know that the side character has this feeling? How does the main character know that the side character is going through this or like, this is the emotion the side character is catching. And I'm totally rambling because I'm drunk, aren't I? Yeah. I need to just quiet my mouth. Like I'm going to kill somebody. That's right, folks. Charles is a much harder reviewer than I'm ever going to be. Like mine is like, oh, is this little RPG? These are good game mechanics. Yes or no. How to get down with the story. See you later, folks. Charles gets in depth. Uh, so, so there you go. If you ever want to like a good constructive point on point, uh, criticism of your stuff, Charles is definitely the man to do it because I mean, I mean, personally, oh. I, that's why I like him as a reviewer and as a beta reader, because his, 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 uh, his, his the stuff he looks at are on point. Um, going back to a few more of the writing wait, publishing wait, wait, questions. Wait, wait. Can, I, can I go over one more thing? Uh, uh sure. Sure, this man. Is, this is, I'm so sorry. I, I want to describe one thing really quick and this is totally going to be my lascivious nature, but I am really liking, like, I like Eric Rounds, and I like his book, and it's good. It does have that part that I don't like, where he kind of, like, just tells me what the emotions of everyone is. Um, but R is R. Oh, my God. Oh, no. I call <sighs> stolen your words. No, I'm just, I'm trying to think about the grammar of that. Would that be an is or an R? He tells me what the emotions, so the emotions is plural, are. Okay, we're good. Yep. Um, so... When <laughs> not, not Charles is a tough butt to crack. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Um, but one thing I will say about this, and this is something that I've noticed, and I am really getting tired of this, is I have a great cover artist. I love my cover artist, but I had to really kind of like nail my cover artist to the ground on this. And I have to like work with other people is when people post it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this up here so you can see this. And if you could, could you grab the uh, Project Alpha in the background? Oh, sure. I want to I want to see the cover of that really quick. Can you show the people that wonderful book? Because that's an amazing book, and while it could use a little bit of work on the grammar, it is beautiful. There's the cover for me. We can, all, we can all have grammar if the story's there. I'm happy. Um, if you don't have a female character that looks attractive, why do you have a cover? Like I, we're not 
not writing books for like a 75% female split. Like if you want to throw a guy on the cover that looks attractive, totally do that. But if you don't have a female character that you you think is sexy or attractive on your book cover, and how am I supposed to know what the character looks like in the book? And like, eh, I don't know. I feel like I feel like I hate when you're dealing with a cover artist and they give you these covers and they're like, oh, this is really good art. And I'm like, but I don't want to bang the girl on the cover. And that's a problem. That means I don't want to buy your book. And that is uh, Charles' advice on marketing your books. Uh, that would be our next section here. Uh, how do you market your books? I think he's answered that question in part. Any other I, advice on marketing? I, I only got the Ascend Online and the Wayward Bard because they were sent to me and I like the people. Mm. I would not have purchased them because they didn't have a female on there that I wanted to bone. Like that was a problem. All of a sudden I was looking at these books and I'm like, they're not fuckable. <laughs> That's, that's Charles' uh, criteria for, should I read this or not? Is the cover art lady uh, perchable? Yep. Perchable? Is that what you said? Perch yes, yes. Perch perchable. Perch on the girl? Is, is that how you yeah. call it? Do it's we a, need to talk to a, April about this? It's a special position. Uh, it works 90% of the time <laughs> to, yep, to, get, to impregnate. So I, I, I know I've been trying for a while. So there you go. It's successful. <laughs> Have you That's, have you successfully perched on her eggs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm still at home. That's why I'm a stay at home uh, egg 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 warmer at this point. You guys don't know this, but Ramon can't leave his seat because he has a bunch of eggs underneath them that he has to perch onto for nine mm -hmm. months because he is doing the evolved bird avian variety of pregnancy. It's it's uh, it's the perch perch approach. Perch approach. Okay, there we go. So, uh, any actual advice for either writing or marketing? I think I, I know you've always you've always self published. You never you've never tried tr the traditional route. So we'll skip some of those questions. Um, you so any advice on marketing or on publishing? Uh, love your fans. That's it. I mean, I I don't know a reader I have that I don't really like. Um, there's never like for me. Every time a reader comes up to me. I am super pumped. Like it's like the happiest day of my life. I'm like, yes, there's another reader who doesn't want to stab me in the throat for writing a bad book. Um, and you know, if I feel like if you love your fans, your fans will reward you. Like your readers are the people who pay, who write your paychecks and your readers are the people who share your interests. Like you wrote this girl and she's your baby and she's everything that you put your heart and soul into for like God only knows how long. So, when you write it and they love it, like they're basically loving a huge part of you. That's your existence. It's like if you got a child and then that child like had a bunch of fans, like that's what writing a book is. You know, you've, you've made a child and it has a bunch of fans. It's an intellectual one. It's not like a tangible child in the sense that we think. But this seems kind of a creepy analogy. I'll be honest. Your, your child has fans, but go on. Well, I mean, it's like, I, I don't know. For me, every time I see somebody say my book is awesome i get really 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 excited about that person so i try to promote their stuff i try to work with them i try to do everything i can to help them out because them liking my stuff is the greatest compliment i could ever have uh and as a result when i release books they help me out and that's about all i can say to it um i don't know if I'm going to be in this job in a year or if two years from now, the market saturation is going to push me out and I'm going to have to get like, go back to consulting uh, full time again. But for the moment, I am just really happy to have people who are excited to see my work. And as long as the same number of people that are excited to see my work this year exists next year, exists the year after I'm a blessed man. So I'm going to, I'm just going to keep taking care of them. Perfect. Um, one more comment on just uh, getting book reviews that for, for a lot of authors, that's one of the harder concepts of, of, of publishing. You can write your thing, you can be really well done, you can have great cover art, uh, but once you publish it, it kind of go goes out into the wild. And there are some people who do special things to get attention to it and to get those first reviews and those first purchases. Uh, do you do anything special in that regard? Um, hmm. I can't legally answer that, but um, okay. I got named the uh, the self publishing whore for a reason, so you know it's what it is. Oh, there you go, folks. Uh, that that that's sort of an answer. Uh, there we go. Um, let's see, anything else you want to talk about writing wise that you want to include? Um, any special deals you have planned at this point to help promote War Turners Four that I'm not aware of? I I have made my books incredibly cheap and nearly free for all of their existence. And at no point do I feel like I've ever charged somebody 
a significant amount of money per word. Like my books are about four bucks and they average between 140, 150,000 words. So if you didn't like them or you didn't enjoy them, like you, or if you didn't like them, I'm sorry, uh, Amazon will take care of that. I don't know. But if you read my books then, and you liked them even meet moderately, I, you've made your money's back. Like I, I think the fastest reader read my book in four hours. So it's a buck an hour for entertainment. I don't feel like I'm ripping anybody off. So I'm not going to do any sales. Um, I do it at Kindle Unlimited too, so people can do that. Uh, so barring sales, I think one of the things that's coming up for writing is I'm working on a new series. I don't know if I'm, am I supposed to mention that here? Uh, totally up to you, man. Oh. I know it's not been on your show in chapter one at this point. It's still 10,000 words plus in. Do you have a title for it? Yeah, The Heroic Villain. Okay, there we go. Um, but... I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to do any promos for War Turn is 4. I don't generally, like, I, I know that a lot of people pay a lot of money to Amazon and Facebook to keep those little ads up there. I've never done that, and it, it hasn't killed me yet, but I feel like I should because I noticed that Amazon changed its format where it used to do, like, the sponsored and then the, the, the also bots, and now it does the sponsored and then the sponsored and then the sponsored and then the also bots. I was like, dang, how many sets of sponsored do I have to go through before I see the also bots? Yeah. Um, so I know Amazon's formula has really changed, and I think that's going to hurt my sales in the long run if I don't try to try to capitulate. But considering Amazon already takes seventy percent of my money or thirty percent of my money, I don't want to give them like another ten or fifteen percent. Like I just kind of want to keep that ratio as small as possible, if possible. Well, I think marketing is probably one of the harder things for people who are just creatively, uh, just writers who want to create things is one of the harder things because it does take some specific um, educational aspects to it to figure out the different systems because Facebook is different than Amazon, than Twitter, than Instagram or whatever else the case is. Um, and learning how to do good marketing where you're like funneling those those views to your novel and, and where your cost of, uh, your, your rate of return makes the investment very well because I know I talked to plenty of authors about this recently where like they're putting in hundreds of dollars a day or even you know thousands of dollars a month and they're getting a return investment of like oh two or three times what they're investing depending on you know how much they're but, spending and so for them they're uh, they are actually numbers that say oh if i put in x amount of dollars I'm, I'm getting these sales but they also have like a longer series so that the money they're investing i'm getting new readers into book one you know completes out the entire series so for me, I would normally agree with you. I would normally sit down and say, yeah, you're absolutely 100% right. But what that is missing out on is a lot of the marketing for Amazon, and it's why I've been really reluctant to get into it, is it's a game theory in, in interception. If both players don't market, if both players step back, then Amazon's also bought engine will market both players at an even rate. So you end up with Amazon trying to encourage you to turn on your ally, so to speak, turn on your fellow writer and be like, your stuff isn't good enough and I'm gonna pay hundreds of dollars to make sure nobody sees your stuff. And that's what you're doing. You're paying a ton of money to make sure that no one else sees this person's stuff. And I mean, I respect that and it does get you some sales and I've seen these people hitting like, top 1% and like, you know, the top like 100 uh, authors and all. And it, but it's a quick burn. And I'm wondering if if they just sat there and didn't do that, if over time, they wouldn't still make those sales, because it's not like the market's going to disappear. It's not like the readers are going to just fade out of existence if they don't see your book the first five minutes. A lot of times, especially as, as I've seen with all your books is like, my books typically don't do super hot the first month. And they just keep going. Whereas I look at other people and their books don't do or do super hot the first month and then just peter out. And I'm wondering if they're paying a bunch of money to get the early readership. And then as time goes on and we hit the dry spells in March and we hit the dry spells that come up in mid June, if the readers that they're paying for heavy amounts in the, in the current month wouldn't still be there waiting for them in March and they wouldn't still get the sales and they wouldn't still get the word of mouth going on. So it's kind of one of those things where you're paying to screw the other authors and Amazon is the only one who's technically benefiting on the large game theory market of it. Like if both players did nothing, then both authors would walk away with a larger percentage of the pot. But because one author pays and the other author has to pay and then they both end up losing. Right, no, definitely sometimes advertising feels like uh, pay to win. Uh, without a doubt, uh, I, I can definitely vouch for that particular feeling there. Have but, a couple comments from chat room uh, that we'll talk about it real quick. Let's see. And before we get into more, more comments at this point, uh, questions from the audience. So that anybody who has a question in chat room who's live, please drop your questions. I'll be asking them. Um, one 
viewer says, uh, by the way, any idea when the audiobook for book four, I'm assuming War Eternus will come out? January. It'll come out January. Um, the reason it's going to take a minute is because, Jeff, you need you need to hook up with somebody, man. Like, come on. Jeff, I love you, man. Want the best for you. Uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's a that, that that's a thing, man. <laughs> so, um, Gerber Wathrig apparently is right. is disturbed by the lack of your your, your bed being made. He says, "Make your make your bed, Charles." So, yep. I was too busy cleaning up like other stuff and paraphernalia. Oh yeah. Oh no, guys, you have no idea what was in that room before the before we hit the light button. There were just things hanging out everywhere, weird contraptions left and right, uh, blow up blow up things of various sizes and shapes. Man, that's this true. is this is the, this is the cleaner version. I've got seven blow up dolls that I had to stuff in the closet. When you open that closet, they're just going to all pop out. Yeah, it's like a big, it's like, it's like one of those clown cars, only it's his closet and, and a bunch of dolls. Yeah. Mm. Let's not for, for, forget the Siamese twins I had to hide under the bed. Mm, if, you, if, you, if you listen carefully, you can hear their moans. It's like, help me. No. <laughs> you can't hear the, the gags work. Oh, there you go. Okay, uh, let's see some questions from the audience. We have Justin Barber who who left some notes, and we have actually grabbed some questions from the internet, a uh, bunch of places where we like uh, put put up um, advertisements for the podcast on various Facebook pages. Some people did drop some questions there, including Justin Barber who asked, um, he wants to know if Lee is uh, is a use all his potions right away kind of guy or a hoarder because he swears he says both at different times. He is both. Honestly, uh, Lee is, as I mentioned earlier, still a human and humans are contradictions. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever been married and had the issue with your wife remembering what you said like four months ago about a subject where it's like, I tell my wife, I'm like, hey, I think this should be the case. And then four months later, I say something different because I'm a human being and depending on mood, time, information, and whatever the heck's ticking me off, my opinion will change. Well, my wife... She's not hysterical. She's historical. She'll just be sitting there and she'll be like, well, Charles, on the night of March 14th, 2016, you said, and I quote, blah, 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 blah. So now that you're saying it differently, I don't know if I can trust you. And I'm just sitting here like, honey, fuck off. <laughs> like, I can't believe you would say this shit. Like, don't bring this up. Don't bring this up. I don't want to be quoted with my own words against me. It's like every time I see a politician who says something in like 2016 and they quote him differently in 2018 and they're like, clearly he was lying. I'm like, no, he's just me. Like, I just forget what I'm saying too. Like, am I a dumbass? Yes. Do you need to point it out? Please don't. Just let me have my illusion of being somewhat decent. There we go, folks. The answer to is Leah Hoarder. <laughs> That's his answer. Okay. Uh, next question is uh, from Cindy Kopeg. Uh, Kopeg. Uh, if the plural of goose is geese, why isn't the plural of moose meese? Fuck English. Aren't you English major? I mean, didn't you like to have a like a bachelor's degree or something in English? Yeah, I had it in British literature because I managed to read every single book ever written in English um, from 1800 back. I stopped at 1800 because the age of sensationalism with that Jane Eyre and or Jane Austen are part of my language card in my language I need to I need to tone it down that awful wench of a woman and her terrible terrible writing ruined my love of English and I had to stop reading after any book written after that period of time well there you go folks that's that's why um D Wilmarth asked um ask him why he sacrificed half of his beard power uh, because even with half of my beard power, I am more beard than any other lit RPG person. So there's that. I wow. dare, I dare anybody in the lit RPG community to come challenge my beard. Well, thrown down that beard tower. Um, I want to say like, <laughs> that I met some authors who had some very magnificent beards at a conference in Las Vegas recently. Um, Tom, but did they beat this? Um, yeah, the, these guys uh, had like the full on thick biker beards that were like, you could probably cosplay as Santa Claus fairly easily. You know, those kind of thick beards. But they're not lit RPG, are they? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, um, I don't believe you. I need to see the pictures. I've been to the conferences. I went to Dragon Con. I've been to two conferences. And I've yet to see a lit RPG person with a better beard so they can all bring it. Yep. I think we're going to have the beard wars at the next uh, Dragon Con where it's just like a bunch of lit RPG authors just beards fighting each other. Uh, I'll do a whole like wraparound video of, of, of these fights. I think it'll be amazing. 
Didn't he just condemn his own novels? Yes, my novels were written past 1800, so they're terrible. You, sh yep. you, should, you should read them to study how bad they are and read them over and over again after purchasing them each individual time. Yeah, Alfred and Chatham says, goatees beat beards, lol. No, <laughs> goatees yeah. are like, no. Baby beards. I mean, every time you see a jerk on TV, he's got a goatee. Every time you see like a villain that doesn't make sense and he's just a, like, he's just a total something nozzle. He's got a goatee. And then you're just sitting there and you see all of these goatees on terrible people in TV and movies and pop culture and goatees just like in real life, every time you see someone with a goatee, you're just like, why would you do that? And then at the end of the day, like people have been exposed to this much awfulness uh, behind people who wear goatees. And they're like, you know what? I'm going to get one. That seems like a great idea. It seems like, it seems like that's my role model move. Mm. And I'm uh, sitting here like that. That's like watching World War II and being like, I want to get a Charlie Chaplin mustache. Like, really? Yeah, I feel like I don't know. I should pull up a picture of Jess Hayes when you're when you're talking about goatees and stuff. I know. I'm totally doing this specifically to make fun of Jeff Hayes. I actually yeah, don't yeah. have an issue with goatees. Yeah, it's uh, that's what I that's what I figured. I'm like, oh no, he's 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 teasing Jeff at this point. Um, I'm like, okay, so we'll throw a picture of Jeff just so you can see what we're talking about. So there's Jeff Hayes. We can zoom in a little bit here. Him and his his go tell, but his 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 beard has been filling in quite nicely. I've been rather impressed. I'll admit. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's no longer got the uh, the same the same goatee he used to have. But I used to love teasing him about his goatee. So every time somebody brings up a goatee, and I know he's watching or potentially watching, I like to make fun of it. Which, if you guys want to know why you run into random long words in my novels, it's because I like the fact that Jeff Hayes can't pronounce certain words, and so I will make them there and watch him struggle and enjoy his suffering wow a lot of goatee <laughs> hate in the chat room like those goatees are the rat tails of the 2010s uh that well look at you guys folks uh but yeah jeff hayes is our friend by the way i should put a disclaimer he's okay with teasing um as far as i know we've we've all talked and teased each other a lot he's okay with it um we all love him he knows that so it's it's all done in good fun so don't yell at us uh, i know some people think you're really mean to jeff when they see drinking with charles um, oh, so. he is so mean to me back. Like Jeff has definitely given me a what for uh, multiple times. Um, I, I love that about my relationship with him because most people I have to be really nice to. Uh, there's this guy named Dakota who has to be the nicest person I've ever met. Like in my life, I've never met somebody who is literally like, I just met this guy for the first time. And he's like, let's have a prayer and let's talk about this problem you're having in real life. And let me help you out and I can do anything. This guy is like just oozing niceness. And that's wonderful. But I feel like I can't be myself because I'm naturally a snarky, insulting, derogatory person. So I'm sitting here like, well, now I've got to be nice to this guy. And I, I you know, I've never felt like being nice was an insult. But it feels like I can't ever say anything mean about Dakota because he's such a nice guy. Whereas with Jeff, I could say something mean and he'll say something mean back and then we'll just go back and forth laughing the entire time having a beer. Yeah, not that you don't like Dakota though. I want to make sure that's really oh, clear. You, you like Dakota. Dakota's a nice I, guy. I, I love Dakota yeah. as a person. He's a great guy. I, I think Dakota's one of the nicest guys there is. <sighs> But it's that word nice. It, it, it's uh, it's hard to deal with, especially in a world where I'm taught that every person is secretly a jerk. And so when somebody is this nice to you, you're just like, this can't be real, is it? And then I talk to other people and they're like, no, he's just that nice. He's yeah. literally, this isn't, he's not messing with you. He's literally just the nicest guy you're going to meet. In the yeah, he will pun you to death though. He will, he will absolutely pun you to death. Uh, I can keep up. Yeah. Okay, uh, more questions from the audience. Uh, we have uh, Eric Rounds who asked, who would win in a fight between Lee and Darwin? Hmm. Darwin. Darwin, why so? Higher level. Okay, I was thinking like a Lee, I, I was on Lee's side to be honest. Like he can he can spontaneously bring out bacon and beer, distract the heck out of out of Darwin and just, you know, use his mysterious crafting powers and, and godlike abilities at some point. But uh, Darwin does level significantly higher than Lee I think ever would. Darwin has rage powers. Mm. Um, the, the power Darwin, of anger is that like symbolic of like the strength of a writer? Darwin is my OPMC, and Lee is not. Lee, for all of his OPness, and he is slowly getting there because power scaling is, oh, it's becoming a nightmare. 
it's becoming a nightmare to work with the power scaling on on Lee. And so um, one of the things I'm having to do is move Lee into more of a mage like role because as long as he has mana, he has health and he recoups his health, I think at like half a percent or 1% per second. So it's like, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's stupid how fast he can regain health. Um, and so to try to deal with the, the tension or the lack of tension that book four had due to the fact that Lee has power scaled, I have to figure out ways to get him to burn his mana fast. And that's, that's becoming you literally a mean burn at this point. Right. I do mean yeah. burn literally. Yeah. That was uh, one of my favorite powers in book four, by the way. I was like, Oh, nice fire breath great. attack involving alcohol. I was like, Ooh, really nice. Darwin can kill things in one hit and he comes back to life with even more power for like uh, several minutes. So he has uh, several significant advantages that would, would give him uh, the edge up in, in combat. And it's because during my first book, I didn't understand how power scaling worked and I wrote a lit RPG. So I couldn't avoid the power scaling. Like the rules were already set in place. And by the time the end of book one came, I was just sitting here like with my hand against my head, like, dear God, why did I do this? Like, why did I write the rules in a way that they could be abused? And one of the biggest abuses was I wrote it with multiplication and power scaling to an exponential point versus um, the game world with War Eternus is additive. So it, the, the advantage with the multiplication is a level 100 player feels like a level 100 player versus a level 20 player. Um, versus, however, with the additive world, because you're only getting a set experience and it's always going to be proportionally less each level so that by the time you hit like level 100 to 101, it's less than 1% increase in stats versus the other one where it's like over, it's going to be higher. So like the difference between 100 and 101 is going to be greater in the bathrobe night than it would between one and two. And then in war Turnus, one and 101, 100 to 101 is going to be significantly less, like just, leagues less than it would be between one and two. And so the additive gives me the ability to eventually scale things down to where the main character is going to be using skills and, and stuff at the end game versus stats. And at the other book, it's going to be just always stats. Stats are just always going to be really high for Darwin. And that was one of the reasons I switched to Merchant of Tikpa is because I couldn't write a fourth book of the bathroom night and add any tension. Mm. See, there you go, folks. Math matters in Lit RPG. It, there's an actual like mathematical component, and and everything he said makes total sense. Um, because we're we're very some of us are very crunchy writers and readers, and we we enjoy that math stuff. Um, the power of multiplication versus addition. Uh, that's that's one of the favorite parts of this. Um, chat room says Darwin plus spoon equals winning. Um, and also actually, Dar will Darwin uh, go super saiyan? One of the big things yeah. in War Eternus that's my sleeper thing that I don't know if people have noticed is little Ethan ha is the only character in the entire book that gets a multiplication boost every single level point. So he, when he goes from level one uh, of initiate to level two of initiate, it's a 5% increase. So he goes from one to 1 1.05 in terms of size and combat ability. But that 0 0.05 gets multiple or 1.05 gets multiplied each time. So by the time he's reached like what's level 20, he's at like five times and in, in six times, like uh, every time he gets scaled up. And I remember one of the times, like my editor called up and he was like, it should be a 5% increase. And I was like, yeah, each level is a 5% increase. And he's like, so why is he getting a 27% increase this level? And I was like, because it's a 5% increase over the previous level. And um, the, we left that in there because I really am looking forward to little Ethan becoming an actual, much more prolific character in the novel. Like I want to have essentially mice rodent dragon combos and have them breathing fire and stuff like that. So we're going to have some real fun trying to figure out how to get the fire added in since they can't channel mana. I, I my hypothesis, I remember in book one was like, oh, this Ethan's going to be like a little golem army at some point. Uh, where he's like a super powerful, super important character, and he's gonna make super overpowered. And it looks like you're confirming that in a, in a little bit uh, 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 of what you're saying. Yeah, his combat ability is roughly four to five times what it was in book one. And right. by the time he reaches book five, which is coming up right now, um, and the fact that Little Ethan is constantly there, and Little Ethan gives him. Uh, he's also a point where I feel like Lee uh, doesn't abuse Little Ethan properly. Um, yeah. Not, not nearly enough. He's using him as like a shield and like uh, scouts at this point. We could really be doing some serious damage. 
he could be using him as a training point too. He could yeah. be he could be giving little Ethan tiny little swords and how. Oh no, because that's that's definitely one of the things about Lord Ethan. He 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 can train and he can learn uh, at the things that Lee learns. If I'm not mistaken, like so he can learn his own skills and abilities. But Lee has never really abused that because he he's had other things to do with. Mm. He's constantly paranoid. Is why little Ethan. Um, and I call him Little Ethan because that's his name. Chet Sandberg asked, like, why is he called Little? Why do I keep calling him Little Ethan? His full name is Little Ethan. That is exactly what he got named at the beginning. It wasn't Little wasn't uh, an adjective. That's actually part of the name. The same way you call somebody Little Tony. Um, wait, do you guys call people like that where you're from, or is that just Little Tonys? Like, do you have like people where you add in an adjective to their name and it becomes part of their name? Yeah, like there's Big Tony. He's the dad. Little Tony's the the son or something. Um, doesn't doesn't that actually be relative to their actual like mass or anything? Yeah, and they often it becomes an ironic point when the five year old kid who was called Little Tony grows up into like a three hundred pound guy, and you're like, yeah. he's Little Tony. Little Tony. Um, yeah. Uh, so no, his name is Little Ethan, and one of the things that I'm really excited about with Little Ethan is just all the different ways we can creatively use him. But Lee is like as i make fun of in the story he doesn't have the high wisdom stat he is definitely a character that i i designed to be not a goku level of stupid as dragon ball z goes but he's not like he's not the smartest character in the group and he's not the wisest character and he makes a lot of bad decisions and one of the bad decisions he makes is just his use of little ethan and the decision is poorly made because of paranoia mm. He is continuously worried about being snuck up on, being stabbed in the back, having somebody think. So he's always trying to keep his little Ethans as, oh, alcohol coming back. Um, he's always trying to keep his little Ethans as, uh, you know, safety switches. They're like his perimeter guards. And he, he's doing this because after he got captured in book two, wait, spoilers. Sorry, but, folks. Yeah. Um, after he gets captured in book two, he starts to really panic about the idea that every time he goes to sleep or every time he does something, something is going to happen to him. And his paranoia, it's its obviously growing, but I don't know how obvious it is to the reader that his paranoia is growing. I don't know if from like, I mean, you could probably tell me better than I could, but from a reader's perspective, is it clear that the PTSD, the paranoia, like, and this is something that I've talked with a lot of like people who come back from war zones where they talk about how they look at like a simple wire and they think it's a trip wire or they look at a bush and they wonder like what's behind it and stuff like that. And I'm wondering if that, uh, if that comes clear for, for Lee. And that is one of the reasons he doesn't use little Ethan, right? Is because he's constantly like little Ethan needs to be on this protective duty. Little Ethan needs to be keeping my safe because I'm, I'm still worried. I, I think that it's clear that he's using a uh, little in that way as like scouts to protect people as like shields for the people he cares about. Um, I've never personally connected it to that particular aspect of his incarceration where he's kidnapped and thrown in the gladiator ring. Um, I, I honestly, I never really connected that particular change in how he uses that particular, because even before then in book one, he still used him as a scout primarily. Um, uh, he had combat in book one. He actually yeah. had a scene. Well, I mean, but he didn't have like he was. He, that's how he's continued to use Little Ethan uh, from book one. So it wasn't as big of a shift in the way that you're, you're talking motivationally uh, for for the character. So I, I oh. extra insight, folks. Oh, hold on a second. In book one, the character he Little Ethan killed was an old man whose name is a Chinese word for green hat. Oh, which, I remember that. Yeah. And if you know what green hat means in Chinese, it, it's it's a word for a man who has been cuckolded. So it was really funny to have that put in there where it's like the old couple with the guy and the girl working together, but the man's name was Green Hat, and I couldn't stop laughing. I was like... Yeah, there's all those little jokes, folks, that nobody else ever gets, uh, unless they're specifically crafted for like individual people. A couple of comments from the chat room. Nope. Um, Chet Pepper says, we don't use those kind of um, adjectives with names unless they're like shitty Carl or trust a trustable Sean. Um, so there you go. Some answers there. A uh, couple more questions from the audience. Let's see. We have, um, I asked who would win in a fight between Lee and Jade. Mm. I figure that at some point that's going to happen if the series continues long enough, but you also just included like an extra caveat. hundred, uh, Harold, I think. So here's a caveat is, is there a fight around? Because if there's enough dead bodies, I feel like Jade is nearly invincible, but the problem with Jade is. Her mobility is very low. Um, her cast time is incredibly high. 
and her combat abilities are non-existent nearly like she is a summoner and so it's like who would win um somebody who has really fast and high direct damage uh, abilities with high tanking versus somebody who has a godly summon but takes like five to six seconds to get there right um and i think i would always go with somebody who is high dd like because the rogue always kills the mage for a reason like uh, if you have enough dd that you can burn somebody down in a few seconds then you're just um you're just gonna win the fight against the person who <laughs> needs several seconds to get going like the, the map isn't there it's like who would win in a race the guy who goes twice as fast uh there and half as fast back or the guy who goes there and back at the same speed and like one you've got like it, it the math is just always going to favor one person over the other no perfect yeah i definitely agree with you i um, kind of depends situationally um on the question see um next question we have is from uh cindy cop again which muppet do you most closely resemble and why which what which muppet which Muppet do you most closely resemble and why? I, I don't know Muppets that well. Oh, okay. Well, we have a couple of big contenders. This was a, honestly a surprisingly uh, contentious um, point in like the chat or in, in the Facebook group where we were, we were talking about this. I'll pull up a couple of pictures, but I think we kind of agreed on like two particular characters um, as 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 being the ones that most closely resemble you. We have uh, Animal. We have Sinister Sam. Um, hmm. And we have uh, Sweetums. So Sinister Sam is this character. If you can see us in the video chat, in the video portion of this. Um, and I chose Sweetums uh, mostly I because feel like, I feel like, like I'm drawn to Sweetums just because of like the decorations on them. Yeah, yeah. I figure like, oh, your your beard kind of grows into your chest hair a lot, and I've seen it. It it kind of just blends in. Um, so I figured Sweetums is better. Plus, he's more of a ladies' man according to this picture that we're showing here. But Eric Roundside was Sinister Sam, which is a cowboy-esque um, murder hobo. Can, uh, I, of, can I mention so. that Cindy Cope is a great person? Like, uh, she has a really cool fascination with birds that I find absolutely endearing. And I've learned more about pets and animals, which is really helping my writing from her than I thought I would. Like, oh, good. I didn't She's know. Very nice, yeah. I didn't know exactly how needy certain birds were because of intellectually, apparently, they're like two or three year olds that just never grow past that phase, which um, I, there's just a lot of cool facts about avian stuff that Cindy is just a pro on. And I think I'm going to give her a shout out on that. Great. Yeah. So there you go. Shout out for Cindy. Um, Alaric says Beaker is a good uh, I would analogy for you. Animal, honestly, like he plays drums and I was a drummer for a long period of time. Um, Another one is Nuffleupagus. Um, so all kinds of suggestions for hairy, hairy, hairy versions of you. And the bird will probably outlive you. Yeah, there's yes. actually birds that live to 90 years old. And I mean, I'm a very healthy guy with a lot of healthy habits. Yeah, as he as he downs the alcohol in his bathrobe. Yep. And he adds it to the collection on the floor. Uh, so yeah, I, I the, have uh, a collection on the floor, but I'm not going to pull it up here because I, okay, I, I believe you. I, I know. I know. We've, we've done oh. enough drinking with Charles at this point. Where we're like, oh, I, everybody kind of understands. Yeah. I, I had to I had to hold myself back because I thought about using the, the the goblet this round and I was like no if I use the goblet I'll drink it too quickly. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, who is your nemesis? Emmy Carlson asks, "Who's your nemesis other than Ramon?" That's a tough one. Um, I think this guy's a. Uh... I think there's just one reviewer that keeps commenting on your stuff. Uh, no, I, I like. There's this guy Seeker who I really like, who's a reviewer, and he always poops all over my stuff. But he poops on it in a way that just makes me either laugh and think he's like totally doesn't know science and physics, or laugh and think, "Oh, he had a point there, and it, it was interesting." And I always look forward to his comments because they're insightful in one direction or the other. Um, so I've never, I'm never really hateful on bad reviewers that are consistent. Like a lot of the reviewers that have given me negative stuff, but they read every single one of my books I like. Um, what I am missing out on is, um, or rather what I would consider one of my nemesis would be, God, this is tough. Carpal tunnel. Can carpal I go tunnel with the I have there carpal tunnel and I have trouble writing more than 4,000 words in a day without incredible amounts of pain because I used to type 400 plus words a minute and I would type an average of 417 
And these were four character words because these were for, uh, one of my first jobs was I would type, well, this is after construction during high or during college, I would type up accident reports for Texas. And so anytime you got in a fatal accident in Texas, I was the guy who would type up your report because the police would write it in terrible handwriting. And then I would transfer it over from terrible handwriting and to decent text. And then there would be two people to check my stuff and you got paid per document and docked per error. So wow. yeah. all of most of it was four words, five words, um, four characters, five character words. And I, I would average it between 415 to 417 for like the first two or three months. And then it just dropped down to 100. And now I barely type 115 words per minute because it just hurts. It, it's really painful. Um, you're not supposed to type that fast. And uh, the need for money had driven me at the beginning because I was starting up a business um, where I would sell balls door to door and I needed the money badly to get the inventory going. Mm -hmm. Oh, B A W L S. Oh, okay. Do you need a picture of it? No, no, it's okay. We we won't show those on the podcast. It's okay. It's uh, it's an energy drink, and the distributor would charge me if you bought less than five crates, you had to pay like a ridiculous fee. But if you bought over five crates of it, you had to pay less than one penny per crate in shipping, and it was really good. And you would pick them up from Comp USA, and we would sell them door to door with the distributor's license. All right. That was my first. Uh, that was the first business I started. Yeah, the chat room is definitely not sympathetic towards your like 4K words. I think Chet Summer says like, oh, crocodile tears, 4,000 words a day. Oh, no. Well, this is including um, 4,000 words, including yeah. anything I text or type or Facebook conversations. All of these go into that. Um, okay. there's, there's a very hard limit in how much I can use a computer a day. I would say after the second hour of computer use, uh, I want to type and, I, and it's just absolutely painful. And I'll sit there and I'll ice my hand and it still hurts. And... I will throw my hand on like massages and stuff like that. Like where I'll try to, you know, you, you take your own hand and you just try to like massage right here where the wrist is. You just kind of put your thumb here and try to work on it. Right. And uh, it just doesn't do it. Yeah. So there you go. And uh, Keegan also says he claims the right of rivalry, rivalry for you. So there you go. You have a rival. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, abstract. Uh, Keegan is not getting the right of rivalry because he and I are beard bros. And uh, if he wants to get the right of rivalry, he has to uh, renounce his beard brother. That definitely sounds like a different kind of podcast, beard bros. Um, next question. Uh, why do you hate coffee? Taste. I have taste buds. There you go. Um, what is your favorite beer? That's a tough one. Um, so I really like the Sam Adams Winter Lager and the Sam Adams Oktoberfest. I think they're really great beers in terms of like what's really drinkable. And I'm going with mass beers because I used to have um, micro beers that I loved a lot, but you can't get them everywhere. So when I'd be like, oh, I'd go to a new area, I would find myself just unable to drink my beer. And you will eventually develop a taste for a specific beer if you drink it enough. Like it, it tastes like home and I like that feeling of drinking a beer that tastes like home. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Um, so I ended up switching to Yingling because it's really drinkable. It's very light. It has a low alcohol content. You can just sip on it all night long. It's not really going to affect your mood, your, your sensibilities. Um, the winter lager from Sam Adams is absolutely delicious, but it's seasonal. And Oktoberfest from Sam Adams is probably one of the best, but it's also, again, a seasonal one. And then the Sam Adams regular one just loses out in every sense to uh, Yingling. So why bother? Which Yingling is where the name Ling comes from because her father is named Mr. Ying. Oh, so there you go. All kinds of insights, folks. A um, couple notes from the chat that says, uh, Chet Sandberg says, Kinesis Advantage would help. I have a wrist injury and it helps him. Amy Carlson says, burnt water is equal to coffee. So... There you go. Yeah. So Chet, I actually have a keyboard because there's this guy called Michael Scott Earl, who is a saint and a wonderful man and a great person. And when I told him about my carpal tunnel issue, he said that he had similar issues with writing a lot. And he actually helped me pick out a keyboard that was perfect for me. And I use it, but the problem is, it is it's a column keyboard. So it's really hard for me to type out without errors. And I end up slowing myself down and it's just, it's a nightmare to use some. Um, I can't do drag on because it hates the way I talk, especially when I'm slurring because I've been drinking. I would imagine the slurs from drinking would be the biggest issue, yeah. I mean, right now I've drank, uh, this is this is my second bottle of wine for the day and I am almost finished with it, um, which is, it's a really happy day for me because I haven't drank in a week. And so this is like, yay. Oh, happy days. We can drink till we pass out. 
Well, okay. I was going to drink yesterday. My wife bought two bottles of wine and she used one for cooking and then half of the next one for cooking. And then she oh. watched the other half. And I was like, God damn it. She's like, it's super cheap $5 wine just meant for cooking. What are you doing with it? And I was like, I don't give a damn. I want my wine. Dude. I don't have uh, a problem. More insights uh, than you were expecting, folks, from the author interview. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, if you could get drunk with any literary author, who would you pick and what would you drink? Uh, so I've gotten drunk with nearly every one. So I'm going to assume that this is a new author. Sure. And out of the new authors, uh, I would pick uh, William Arand, but he hates drinking. Um, so I can't drink with him. Mm. And uh, that leaves just a few left over. And I think if I really could pick an author that I would get to have a drink with, I think Michael Scott Earl or he's not a lit RPG anymore, is he? He wrote one little RPG series. I, I still consider him part of the community because he it, he has the Lions Quest series. It's a it's a he he said he plans to finish it at some point, um, but he say also says it's his least um, financially successful um, series. So he will get to it eventually. But he's so a really I, nice guy. He's he, he really has, fun to drink with. Yeah, I think Michael Scott Earl is one of my favorite authors yeah. of all time. He's a great guy. I I every time I talk with him. He's one of those people that won't talk with you for a very long time. He's gonna have a very short, brief conversation with you, but he's gonna yeah, try to cheer you up during that conversation. So no matter what you're doing, he's gonna cheer you up and then he's gonna blow you off. It's like he brings your mood up and then he's like, good, now I've done my job, have a nice day. And I like that about him. Nobody does it smoother than, than Michael Scott Early. He's like, hey, are you having a good day? I hope you're having a good day, now have a good day. And you're like, wait, what? I said good day. <laughs> um, I would love to have a drink with him. Um, and I know this one's going to be a little bit controversial, but I, I would like to get drunk with Kong and ask him what the hell on a few subjects. Um, I think he's like, I met Kong once in Atlanta and I didn't have a bad time drinking with him. I just want to ask him what the hell when he's actually drunk, like with the trademark issue, like, what were you thinking? No, I'm sure there are lots of questions you could ask him. Um, he's generally a very nice, per a personable man uh, when you meet him. Uh, so I know a lot of people have had interactions with him. I'm sure you'll get a chance to talk to him at DragonCon. Um, I, 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 so. I, I met him at DragonCon, and I had questions because um, he's done some things that I'm like, I don't understand. I just don't get. Like It, it, it doesn't seem like they put him in any positive way. Like, it's not like a move forward. It doesn't endear him to the community. It doesn't get him more readers. I'm just like, why are you doing this? And I want to understand. And I feel like if we were to share a bottle of alcohol, we were to sit down and we were to hash it out, I would at least understand. I might not walk away being like, oh, man, Kong is the best guy ever. Or Kong is the worst guy ever. At least I would just have an understanding of what the hell went through his head on certain decisions. Um, so that would be my other one. And I'm only mentioning him because we haven't had a chance to really drink together. And he has bought me a beer. So I feel like I'm indebted to at least drink with him once and, and see what the hell, like, I, I don't know. That's, that's, that's probably the most controversial thing I can say because I know that the lit RPG community is really divided into the love Kong and the hate Kong group. And I don't know Kong, so I don't know what to do um, with that one. So that's, that's one of the ones I would pick. I think those are all fair statements and a fair description of some communities um personally no harsh feelings towards Kong myself i've always had pleasant uh interactions with them whenever i've had a chance to talk to him or meet him with the you know exception of a few recent know, ones. but he, yeah uh, yeah well, there I you go so can i say this uh probably not uh so we'll have one more question for you and then we'll log off for the night since it'll be I, about I two hours at that point We'll go, uh, will you be attending Dragon Con 2019? So people have a chance to meet you if they happen to attend the Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia in 2019. It depends how well my books sell. Mm, my that's books always sell the really well, I'll see you in 2019. If they don't sell well, you know, is what it is. Um, I, 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 are you sure I can't say it? Yep, I'm pretty, fairly sure where you're going to go with that, but it's okay. So 2019 Dragon Con uh, is, is a place you can meet Charles Dean. We'll have a, we'll probably have another Little PG booth there at some point. And oh. so there'll be also be other places where you can probably meet Charles up and, and myself and other Little authors. It's one of my favorite times of the year because I get a chance to meet so many great, amazing Little PG readers and Little PG authors. It, it's kind of the one place in you know one of the few cons where like a, a lot of people will go and meet, and it's it's a great 
uh, gathering place. So hopefully we will have some other things uh, around the United States at different points of the time where other liturgy community members can meet and, and gather. Um, I know recently there was one in Las Vegas. Um, and that was also fun to meet a bunch of liberty authors. So hopefully more things in the year. So, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll end about here. I think it's been about two wait, hours. Wait, it's wait, a wait, good wait. amount of time. If you want something else to say, man, I got, I got two things to say. First off, okay. we need to do a lit RPG con. Okay. I talked to this about before. Did, right? We need to do a lit RPG con because one of the worst parts about dragon con is dragon con is amazing. So it leaves you with very little time to sit down with the authors and we need like a day or two to really digest how awesome the lit RPG community is by hanging out with everybody in it. So if we could get like 200, 300 lit RPG people, book out like a, a crappy hotel somewhere that's cheap so that no one has to pay a ton of money and just have a great time, that would be amazing. I would love to do a lit RPG con. Personally, I'd like to do it in Texas or somewhere where we could blow stuff up, uh, not computers, that, that that's a waste of money. But just take like a rocket launcher and just launch it into like a, a, a log cabin. I will build the log cabin myself. I know how to build a log cabin. And then we will launch a rocket rocket into it and blow it up. And I think that would be a blast. Um, and the second thing is, uh, if I didn't get if I didn't have to pick an author, I want to mention this is I have loved every single person I've met and drank with that was a moderator of the lit RPG or the game lit or any of those communities. Because those people are like the diehards of those communities, and I would really, really enjoy having like a full-on um, drunk fest with all of the moderators from all of the different lit RPG game lit and something. Because like, I mean, Camilla is a blast. Um, I don't, you know, he's not a moderator, um, but Camilla's a blast. Nicholas is a blast. All of the people that I have actually met, sat down, and had a drink with were just amazing. So I'd love to just get all of them together and just have a drink. So that would be that would be a, a, a dream. No, I absolutely agree that there. I think the central location, Las Vegas, is always pretty popular. Lots of hotels there with spaces for for convention sites or or just like side rooms. I don't think that Texas would be too expensive to do something like that. And you know, just pick a hotel, uh, make arrangements for like a conference room or something, and just do a meet and greet for everybody. Um, or for and just authors get drunk later or something. I think it would be very very easy to or very reasonable to like set up. To be honest. The reason I would pick Texas is because of the laws on weaponry. And one of the things that if if there is one thing that lit RPG is, it is a violent, violent genre. Um, there's not like, what is it? Level Up is probably the only non-violent one that I can think of. Does it have violence in it in Level Up, the uh, the office worker guy? There was a boxer. And he like he did some boxing in there, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, not oh, really the like, it's not really the violence that we're thinking of with normal genre. No, no, there's it, it. There's some boxing in there. I think um, if you have think of the same one you are, uh, but yeah, there there are a few. Not not much yeah. violence in there, but yeah, I, I I guess I understand what you're saying. Texas would fit more thematically to the genre. Yeah, so um, Texas would be great thematically because we could have more looser weapon restrictions. Uh, there's more. Oh, space. you mean when like people bring in from like out of state uh, their own weapon collections, sword, like their sword collections for for certain authors of ours, or or, or knife collections? Yeah, yeah, it would yeah, be yeah. fun to see like people bring in their weapon collections, bringing the weapons in, renting weapons that we could use that we wouldn't use on like an RPG. Again, that's something I could never justify using individually. But if as a group we decided we were going to pay and rent an RPG, and then we were just like, you're lighting your face up. Tell me if that wouldn't feel amazing. That would seem very fun. I'm like, oh, yeah, you could probably only do that in Texas. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and then the alcohol laws are a lot looser in Texas. Uh, and like, for instance, in Ohio, I love Ohio, but you can't bring alcohol in really and you can't bring alcohol out. So like the, the amount of alcohol you'd be able to bring with Ohio would just be drastically reduced. Um, then the next thing you've got the advantage of is that it's really cheap to get flights in and out of Houston because it's a hub city in the U.S. Right. Like it's directly center of the U.S., so most people who don't require a passport would easily be able to reach Texas with uh, with minimal cost. Uh, there's several authors who are already living down there, so it wouldn't be a big deal for them. So you've already got authors living down there. You've got really cheap hotels. You've got easy access to weaponry. You've got loose laws with weaponry. You've got loose laws with alcohol. You have lots of space, and that's like a big issue. Is I don't know about you guys, but my ass is a is a fat motherfucker part of my language. Um, 
I am, I am just, I am all sorts of big. And so when I have to go to places that have tiny seats and tiny this and tiny that, and they're built for these Yankees who are all healthy. And I'm like, really, you got to do this to me. Like, don't make fun of me because I love food. Um, and then the next part is Texas has some great steaks and I, I'm going to be honest. Uh, I love meat and I like the idea of going to a place that raises cattle. That would be awesome. Just like, I mean, haven't, haven't, hasn't everybody secretly loved being a butcher, killing a cow, hanging it upside down and carving off a fresh steak yourself? Yes, there you go. So um, great reasons to have a Lit RPG uh, convention in Texas there, according to Charles Dean. So that'll be the end of the official author interview, folks. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks Wait, for, for cheese? being in chat room. Uh, I'm sure Texas has cheese. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a state with cheese. Is it expensive um, cheese? Couldn't tell you. I haven't been in Texas. Well, I have to bring my own cheese. You can ask. You can ask some authors who live there. I'm sure they'll be able to tell you. Uh, but of course, we'll be able to leave the show notes of uh, all the places you can find Charles Dean on Facebook in his uh, um, Spoiled Rotten Readers uh, group there, and also his author Amazon page. All the book links to all his series will be in the show notes, including Goodreads. So if you w plenty of places to find the author. So Charles Dean, thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to like take part in the interview it's always fun to talk with you i know we'll talk afterwards uh but everybody in chat room who, who's hanging out here live uh also thank you for for hanging out with us and for talking and for for having so many amazingly interesting questions i genuinely thank you guys for showing up and for all the folks who are of course watching this love the audio version of the video version of course later so thanks everybody thanks for hanging with out uh and for a little bit of podcast i'm ramon mehan and charles if you want to say goodbye to everybody uh yeah and one other thing too is if you guys ever drop by the discord Feel free to give me a shout out. I'll always be on the Discord. I just won't always be paying attention. And I hope you guys have a great day. Yep. Thanks, also, everybody. Also, hold on. Go ahead. Oh, I got a little bit of the wine left. Let me kill it. There you go. Chug, 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 chug. No, that's more than I thought. I've got another three or four swallows. So I'm going to finish. Okay. Never mind. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thanks a lot. And you guys have a good day. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.